Um, is this thing on? Oh, it's on. All right. Cool. Uh, we have space in the front, so if people don't uh, have anywhere to sit, there's like a bunch of spaces out the front. But I guess I need to start because this is only a half an hour long, and it might uh, run long, it might run short. But, you know, I didn't think anybody was going to actually show up, so i got to do this correctly. So uh, this talk is about augmented reality 2.0, which is kind of a term that I kind of made up. I mean, I don't know if I made it up, but there's, you know, people call it mixed reality, people call it 4D. Everybody's trying to make up, you know, these terms to raise money or whatever. But the bottom line is I just decided to make my own word up. Uh, what I call this collection of features that sort of defines augmented reality 2.0 or what I call it augmented reality 2.0. So how many people here have developed an augmented reality app? Oh, okay. And how many people here have used or developed with Google Tango? Oh, okay, that's more than I thought. So I don't know, this might be pedantic to some of you, this presentation, but or, you know, I guess you just gonna have to deal with it. So I'm Ralph Barbagallo from Florb. This actually is not working. Wait a minute. There we go. Okay. I'm Ralph Barbagallo from Florb. Not very important. You can Google me or whatever. But I've been making augmented reality games, among other things, for, I don't know, about four or five years. And so for the sake of this demonstration to sort of contrast augmented reality 1.0 with 2.0, we'll talk about two of my augmented reality games. One of them is Ether Drift, which is sort of an augmented reality prototype that's basically augmented reality 1.0. And the augmented reality 2.0 game, which is In Our Wars, terrible name I know, but I had to make it up on the spot for the Google Tango Make an App Contest. That is the Google Tango app that I made last year, which is what I would consider a augmented reality 2.0 game. And we'll talk about what the features are and you know what the contrast is between the two. So augmented reality 1.0, kind of, at least gaming-wise, I think kind of started with this game. This is, I don't know if anybody remembers Eye of Judgment on the PlayStation 3 but you kind of took this camera and you, you know, it kind of worked, but not really, but you stuck it on the table and then it could recognize these cards and monsters would pop out of the card and they would allegedly fight. I actually never could get the game to work, but it was an admirable attempt. I mean, it was like 2008, you know, the stuff didn't work that well, but that's still the essence of what I would call augmented reality 1.0, which is a lot of the stuff you're still seeing today. Augmented reality 2.0 is, you know, kind of like for these devices like HoloLens where the device can sense the shape of the world around you and then track the position of the player inside that space. And that description might not make any sense, but once you see what the, how it works and what the ramifications of it are, there's a lot of interesting gameplay possibilities. But we'll talk about augmented reality 1.0 a little bit just so we can you know, determine what the difference is between the two. We're usually, when we talk about AR, we're talking about Qualcomm V4, which isn't made by Qualcomm anymore. They sold it to some like random consulting company, which you know, I'm not that happy about. I don't know what that means for the future, but they're the only game in town for augmented reality on current like phones and tablets and things like that. And so I built a game called Ether Drift, uh, which uses this technology for, you know, basically augmented reality 1.0 experience. And, you know, you've probably seen stuff like this before. It's basically as a card, you show the card to the camera, a character pops on top of the card. Different cards have different characters associated with it. So I'll show another card to the camera and it'll have a different guy on it, and then when you place the two cards together, the two characters fight. Which, if you've used augmented reality you know, to any degree over the past five years, you've probably seen this a million times. But this basically is what happens. We'll wait for this climactic moment when we put these two together, and they'll eventually just, it's kind of like Star Wars chess meets like a Final Fantasy turn-based battle. Uh, this is running off the Unity editor, but it runs on iPad and you know, Android and stuff. So, you know, basic stuff, characters sticking to cards, attacking each other. The thing is, is that this is kind of basically all you can do with augmented reality 1.0, at least up until this point. That's why every game, well, well, they all work on the same principle. They work on image targets. In the case of Qualcomm Euphoria, or whatever company owns it now, Euphoria, it uses image targets, in this case, the cards. So the card you saw, the trading card in the video right here, this card is processed in their cloud service to determine where the features are on the card. These little yellow pluses are areas of contrast, you know. You can see around the letters and stuff where it goes from white to black. It stores all these little points of contrast in a database, and then it uses that database to determine, you know, if it sees the card. And then it can track it with a different algorithm from frame to frame, and that's how you get this little transform reported to your, uh, to, in my case, Unity, which tells you where to place the character. But there are a lot of restrictions with image targets. 
as you saw in the demo, I kind of had to like show the card to the screen a little bit, to the camera, and then eventually would, the character would pop on. It's because recognition time is slower than tracking time. You know, to track the card from frame to frame is actually faster than recognizing the um, actual card itself. And also, like, there's only two cards in Ether Drift. You know, I think V4A kind of sometimes has a limit of like maybe five simultaneous cards it can track. But like the more things you track at once, the less stable the transforms get. Because I guess, you know, just, you can't uh, devote that much CPU time to recognizing and tracking all these objects simultaneously. Which is kind of like puts a damper on a lot of people, people's first idea when they think of augmented reality. They think, oh, I'm going to make Magic the Gathering and augmented re reality. Well, unless you can play with like two cards and you want to hold a phone over it the whole time. I mean, it's not really going to be very fun. So... It, you're kind of limited. The whole image target augmented reality 1.0 thing is, is pretty limiting. And that's why every single augmented reality game you've ever seen, well, until recently, has been basically the same thing. You know, Tekken card tournament, dudes on top of cards. You know, uh, a Kid Icarus Uprising for the 3DS, dudes on top of cards. And that new, you know, Skylanders game for iOS, and dudes on top of cards. Because that's basically what you can do with the previous generation of augmented reality technology. Every game kind of is exactly the same. And it's really because it's a limitation of the technology. But what I'm talking about is augmented reality 2.0, which, you know, again, is a term, you know, I guess I kind of made up. But basically, this is because there's a new generation of devices, like Google Tango, that contain sensors and hardware that is specifically designed for augmented reality. So, like, previously, with Vuforia and stuff like that, you know, they were making augmented reality work on phones and tablets that weren't really designed for the task. They were just running computer vision algorithms on video and stuff like that. But now we have hardware that actually has sensors and processors and technology that's specifically designed for augmented reality. I mean, perhaps not designed specifically for games. You know, it might not be performant enough or whatever, but it's actually hardware designed to make these experiences a lot better. So the elements, what I consider the elements of augmented reality 2.0 are like two major features or algorithms in some cases, not necessarily hardware features. But SLAM, which we'll talk about in the next slide, is an algorithm used to track a position, like I was talking about with HoloLens earlier, track the position of the tablet or the device in the world and build a map out of the world as you're walking around. And we'll talk about the ramifications of that, which you know, means localization. It means that you can know the precise position indoors of the player, uh, or at least the device the player is holding, in, in an indoor environment which has a lot of ramifications for how you can design a game. And depth mapping, so the ability to build a 3D model out of the world you see around you. And you can use that mesh for all kinds of things. And you know, we'll talk about it in the context of the games that I've built, and you can kind of see how it, it uh, might apply to some of your ideas. So SLAM, the, the algorithm, simultaneous localization and mapping, a lot of the stuff was kind of designed for like robots and stuff. Like if you had a Mars rover and you landed on Mars and you've never been there before, you kind of have to, you know, you have with a camera, be able to visually see what's around you, record that sort of in your internal map, and at the same time, keep track of your position on this new planet as you drive around. I and mean, that's kind of one of the original sort of purposes of these types of algorithms. So that means, you know, it uses a camera. So it's not necessarily, it's not that you can't do this on you know, the iPhone. In fact, there's some iPhone games and stuff that use Slam right now. But um, some of these devices, like the, ta uh, the Tango, have separate processors that take a lot of the load off that make these algorithms, which are pretty computationally expensive, uh, easier, to, easier to run. So you have more processor time, more GPU time for your actual game. So although Slam is possible in earlier uh, uh, platforms, it's now much more able to be used for games because performance-wise, it works a lot better. It's so a really bad example. This is one video I had. This just shows the tablet itself. It's tracking the position of the tablet in my house and at the same time moving the camera in unity in my scene in sync with the tablet. Now, you might be saying, oh, like, big deal. You could do that with a compass and gyro. And you kind of can, but the real difference here is that it actually knows where it is in my house. And we'll show that in a, in a different example later. It's not just detecting movement. It kind of knows exactly where it is in the house, depending on how well you, you scan your environment. So there are a lot of limitations, much like image targets for SLAM, you know, because it has some of the same issues, because it is, you know, an optical process, a computer vision algorithm. So kind of the rule of thumb with this is, is, you know, a messy room is better than a clean room. If your walls are all white and you have, like, a lot of concrete floors and stuff, the algorithm doesn't have a lot of features, a lot of points of contrast to track from frame to frame. So you're going to have a lot of problems trying to have uh, a tablet localize itself inside a featureless environment. And on top of that, in addition to lighting problems, you know, if it's too dark or, you know, whatever, that's going to cause problems with the, with the uh, SLAM algorithm. But 
um, if, the, if, the, if the location is dynamic, you know, if, there's a, if you're in a crowded room, you know, people moving around, it's not going to work too well. You need to kind of have like a static, sort of well-lit, but not too bright environment, you know, with a lot of stuff on the walls, that kind of stuff. There's still sort of, it's, it doesn't quite work wherever you want. You kind of have to be in an environment that's sort of optimized to be trackable. So the next element is the depth camera. So the second element of AR 2.0 I believe to be, is the use of the depth cameras. So if you look at the Google Tango on the back, there's an infrared camera. What's essentially on the back of the Google Tango is basically the Kinect that was in, like, in the original Xbox. And it's kind of like glued onto the back of this shield tablet. And that little, I believe it's that little white jewel on the left side is like an infrared camera. And so using the infrared camera, you can kind of sort of get the RGB of every pixel in, you know, in your camera frame, in your video frame, but also the XYZ position of that of that uh, pixel. Not quite, because the resolution of the infrared camera is way lower. It runs at a much lower frame rate, and you can see it's not even really in the same position. You know, it's like off to the side, so there's some parallax error. But they do a lot of magic behind the scenes to interpolate and to uh, use the data in a way that basically gives you a rough sort of depth value for every color value you have in your video frame. And so that lets you build a 3D model out of the world that you're seeing, which you can use for a number of different reasons. So. My, friend here at, uh, my friends here at Paracosm, they have a solution. Now, this is kind of interesting because they use a different tablet, not necessarily the Tango. You can do this with other um, tablets that have depth cameras and stuff. Tango's not the only one. And what they do is they're able to create a depth map out of the world and then use that to um, not only, not only um, use a collision, so like characters can jump on top of tables and things like that, but it also can be used to occlude the object. So, if you would imagine, if you would scan your environment, you could scan this table or this couch, and instead of, you know, if you looked at Ether Drift, when I moved my hand in front of the car, it didn't matter, the character still drew on top of my hand, because the camera doesn't know about, you know, the depth value of what it's seen. But in this case, you can have characters that actually go behind real-world objects. They're occluded by the real world. And that's basically, when people use the term mixed reality, I guess that's where the mix of mixed reality comes in. It allows you to sort of seamlessly integrate virtual 3D objects with the real world. So they made a video here that kind of demonstrates how this works, because the thing is, is, you know, and half the reason why I made this presentation is when I try to explain how Google Tango works to people, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's a lot of weird features that don't seem connected. But when you see them all working together, it, you know, light bulb goes off, which is kind of what happened to me when I got my Tango. When I first, Google first sent it to me, I had no idea what the thing did. And it wasn't until I went to one of their summits and they kind of showed how it worked that it dawned on me that, oh, there's a lot of interesting possibilities here. So maybe this video will help. This video, in this case, they're scanning their office with this, uh, this is actually a Surface tablet with a uh, infrared camera stuck on it, but you can see the end result is it makes, it generates a point cloud, and from this point cloud, they can create a 3D mesh of the office. It's pretty cool. I mean, I wouldn't use this as like an actual in-game geometry, but it's pretty neat that you're able to scan. I would say it probably took them hours and hours and hours and hours and hours to actually scan the office at this fidelity. You can keep doing it and refining it progressively. But the area we're really interested in is this place where we're going to play the game. So if you were to just scan this, this room, you can create this 3D mesh. And you don't have to draw the 3D mesh. You can use it as a collision mesh in Unity. And you can also write it to the depth buffers to use it for occlusion. So you can see here, they're shooting like, like these balls. And the balls are, virtual balls are bouncing off that real table. Because that table is a collision mesh. That's you know, part of the static environment that matches up with the mesh you scan. This character is actually being occluded by the table. So it's walking behind the table. And then when they tap on this couch, it'll actually jump on top of the couch. So it's not only included by the environment, but it's actually to walk over the environment and be included by it at the same time. So, you know, that is really the mix of mixed reality. Perhaps not the sexiest thing you've ever seen of an augmented reality game, but it shows you, I mean, you can just start thinking about the possibilities. You can do a lot of interesting stuff where you can actually mix computer graphics, 3D characters with the real world. You know, it kind of elevates AR beyond kind of like the parlor trick that it kind of is right now, where, oh, look, I see something on a card, and now you, you can actually use the environment that you're in as a gameplay area. So, of course, the depth camera has a lot of restrictions, as these technologies all do. So, in this case, you know, the resolution is lower, like we said. There's some interpolation going on, so the mesh isn't going to be, you know, super-duper high-res. It's not going to be super-duper accurate, at least at this stage of the technology. The frame rate of the camera is low. So you'll notice in that, in that demo, they you know, are just kind of like very slowly walking around. It's, you, know, you have to really deliberately scan the area. I mean, this is clearly, you know, we're at 1.0 of this technology. And it's infrared, so you have a lot of weird problems with reflections. If you have windows, you have like, you know, uh, if you're outdoors, it's not going to work. So 
again, there's a lot of restrictions with these infrared depth cameras, but we're clearly at the beginning of this technology. So the fact that it works at all, to me, is, is incredible. And it's only going to get better with, you know, as the technology progresses. So that brings me to In Our Wars, the terribly named game that I uh, submitted for the Google Tango Make an App Contest. So this game is kind of like a real-time strategy game where two Google Tangos can play in the same room together. And I don't know, you could say it's maybe like Galcon meets maybe Homeworld or something in augmented reality. So your entire room becomes kind of like the space map and there's asteroids and planets floating around and you, can, you have to hunt for the other player's base in the room. So the two people with the two tablets have to walk around and look for each other's bases and at the same time send attack fleets to the different planets and stuff to take them over and stuff like that. We'll show you a video of it. But the, the way I used the augmented reality 2.0 features are that we use the SLAM algorithm. We use it, obviously, to track the position of the tablet in the real world, but we also use it to coordinate the tablets so they have to be in the same coordinate space. You know, when you scan a room with this technology, it's kind of like the coordinates are like relative to the observer, so you have to sort of share that file. It creates this thing called the area definition file in the Tango, which is kind of like a, I mean, I guess it's kind of like a 3D model of your room that you can't actually see, but the tablet uses it to figure out where it is inside the room. You have to share that file with the other tablet, and then both tablets have to kind of start the game in the scanned area so they know where they are. So it was a little tricky. It's a little bit of a juggling act there. We use the depth camera to place actual physical, well, virtual objects on the actual floor so that the other character can actually physically walk into them and trigger them. They're traps. And Persistence, which is related to SLAM, which I think is one of the big features of Augmented Reality 2.0, is that you can place objects in the world and they stay there. You know, if you place an object in this game, if you save the game, you can turn the tablet off and, you know, come back next week and that virtual object is still floating in that part of your room. Uh, as long as you didn't, like, change all the pictures or move the carpet or, you know, move all the furniture around, and then the SLAM algorithm doesn't actually know where it is anymore. So, I have a video here. You can see in this demo, basically I'm in my office and I'll place, I'll place a floating space base in the corner of my office here, a little star base, right near this picture. And then I'm going to go, like, you'd probably be playing this in a bigger area, IRL, but here I'll place this under my shelf here, another base here. And, you know, this is all using SLAM and localization to basically place these objects in the world and track where you are. And then I'll place another one in the corner. And then after I place this third base, now I have to place a trap on the floor. So this, this reticle here is like red. When it, you know, it's looking for a surface normal pointing up. In real time, it's using the infrared camera to figure out where the planes are in the room. So once I hit the floor, the plane turns green, and now it knows that there's a floor there. So I can place a trap right here, which I'll do right here. And then if, you, if I, you know, I, get on my, I got on my knees there, and you can see that it's glued to the floor. So once the other player places his bases, then the whole room is populated with asteroids and planetoids and stuff. So in this case, you're like, oh, this planet's occupied by the enemy. So you can select it. And then once you select it, you can send an attack fleet over. And if you look to the left, you'll see the fleet comes from that base that you place in the corner of your room, and they go attack this, this planet. And each attack takes energy, so you can go mine these asteroids for energy by shooting at them with your uh, little mining laser and tapping this stuff uh, floating, floating out of it. So it is a two-player game. You know, two players can play in the same spot. It uh, you know, uses Unity's uh, UDP networking for uh, like a local network game. And... The one tricky part with this is that because, you know, the tablet uses infrared, you can't, well, move this down, you can't um, have two tablets, well, at least with the Tango, using the infrared camera at the same time because the infrared camera fires off at five frames per second. If the other tablet's five frames per second are, are somehow are at the same time as, the other, as when the other tablet is firing off the laser, you'll get this crosstalk and the tablets will, like, flip out. So in the case of this game, I actually have one tablet where both players place all the objects in and then the other tablet, uh, that information is sent to the other tablet and you start the game. So that the infrared camera is only being used by one tablet at once. You only need the infrared camera at the beginning of the game to place the objects on the floor. So if for, for, at least for the Tango, making a game where two tablets at the same time need to use the depth camera is kind of a problem. So I'm not going to give like a ton of you know, like design rules and design laws for augmented reality because really nobody knows anything. This stuff is just really starting. But the one thing I kind of stumbled upon in making this game is that I think that there's two major kind of categories of augmented reality games. There's games that are in a defined play space, and then there's games that are in an arbitrary play space. So 
And you know, kind of like an augmented reality 1.0, pretty much every game is in a defined play space because you had like a set of cards. The game kind of had to come with the cards, or you had to print them out, or whatever. And so you knew that people were playing with these cards, and you knew they were probably playing with them on a table. So it was kind of like a board game. You know, you buy a board game, you pretty much know, uh, you know, how the game is going to be played and where it's going to be played. And in the real world, there's an allegory to that. You know, like basketball, it's played all over the world, but all over the world, it's played on a basketball court, and those courts all have the same measurements and are designed the same way. So. If you were to do an augmented reality 2.0 game that uses the shape of the world around you and stuff, but you still wanted to do it in a defined play space, you could still do it. Like you could imagine maybe, um, I don't know, like a laser tag arena or something. You could have that same layout in multiple laser tag arenas if you had some sort of augmented reality laser tag. But you've pre-scanned the arena itself and are using that same scan in multiple locations. And you could kind of do that same kind of thing. You know, or there's the arbitrary play space, which is, of course is my office. Or it could be anybody's office, or it could be somebody's kitchen or whatever. You have absolutely no idea where this game is going to be played. And that's where designing games for augmented reality 2.0 get a little tricky, because you kind of have to design a game where you, you're not actually sure where it's going to be played. And in the case of In Our Wars, the, I had to make a bunch of assumptions, just basic assumptions based on how people place objects in the world. So I kind of just assumed that you know, when you place the objects in the game, you're holding the tablet around at this height. So when I populated the world randomly with asteroids and planets and stuff, I had to you know, just make an assumption that if I placed them two feet above where most of the objects are and two feet below where most of the objects are, that they were accessible by the average player. I mean, you could be really short, you could be really tall, I don't actually know, but I had to make this assumption to get the game to kind of work. And so when you make these assumptions, you I just don't think you can cover every case. So the chances are that people's games, if, even if they're designed for an arbitrary play space, are just not going to work in the given environment that somebody's trying to play it. So I'm not here to be like a Tango cheerleader. I mean, in fact, if you download In Our Wars on your Tango, you'll probably notice that it doesn't actually work. And that's because I haven't actually updated it for the latest Tango SDK. They've changed it like 100 times for the better since I've shipped this game, but I just can't keep up with it. But that's OK, because there's next generation platforms coming up. You know, in particular, HoloLens, they just announced the meta. I haven't really seen the meta, I haven't used the meta, but I actually have spent a little bit of time with the HoloLens, and I'm super impressed with the device. And, you know, as soon as I heard about these wearable platforms, you know, I thought about this. Like, I don't know if anybody's ever played uh, Heavy Rain, but in that game, one of the guys has, like, these AR glasses, and he's, like, waiting in this waiting room, and he's playing this virtual handball game where he bounces the ball against a virtual like a virtual ball against a virtual wall while he's just waiting around and you know that was all super futuristic when this game came out which wasn't that long ago but now we can like totally make that with hololens it's kind of it's kind of amazing when i when i actually used the device i was kind of amazed by it because my expectations were rock bottom until i had tried um hololens i had tried a bunch of other ar headsets that just like literally don't work and cost like four times as much so when i saw this and used it i realized you know it actually works it's not to diss Tango, because Tango's an amazing, I mean, it's like three years old now, and it's still, they're still improving it, but it's way more performant than Tango, because it's newer hardware, and it costs like you know, five times as much. But one particular example is the creation of the mesh of the world. Like you saw with the uh, demo I have from Paracos, and we kind of have to walk around very slowly and mesh the environment. Well, with Tango, you, just, you still have to mesh the environment in the demo that I played, but you just kind of like spin around, and you see a mesh being built in real time out of the walls, and then you can start the game. And the mesh itself is pretty high res. And I was just blown away by that. And so uh, also, I'm told that like at the build conference and stuff, they had about 30 HoloLenses or whatever at the same time in the same room. And there appears to be no issues with AR cross, I mean, uh, with infrared crosstalk. So that opens up a lot more possibilities for augmented reality games using infrared, because now you can have multiplayer games that use you know, infrared for dynamic you know, depth information. So, you know, it's not all perfect, of course. I mean, we're still, we're still at a 1.0 stage of this technology. So, you know, there's the FOV restriction that everybody talks about. The augmentation, you know, just happens sort of in a little square in the front of your vision. I personally am not bothered by it because I've seen, I think the FOV on it's a little bit bigger than other devices I've seen. And the rest of the device works so well that I kind of forgot about it after a while. I think it's kind of a big problem. I haven't actually, the meta supposedly solves this problem. I haven't actually seen it, but I, every other uh, uh, headset I've seen has the same issue. It's kind of like a problem with physics. I think, I'm not a physicist, but it seems like it's kind of hard to solve. So maybe they'll solve it eventually, and this thing will be even more amazing. But the uh, restriction, you know, it's definitely a restriction. I think that it kind of prevents it from being a consumer product at this point, but it's definitely, to me, it's definitely impressive. So. 
So basically, you know, there's not a whole lot to be said about like design rules, like I said, about augmented reality 2.0. It's a situation where, you know, the only thing that we really know is that you're, you're, the area you play the game in has to be trackable, whether it's a defined play space or not. In fact, you, and you have to make assumptions about the play space. And in fact, like, you'll notice the HoloLens demos, you know, they always make it look like it's, oh, it's in a living room and it looks just like your living room. But every time I've done the demos, it's in a very deliberately lit and laid out living room where there's like, you know, it's not lit too brightly. There's stuff all over the walls and it's really set up in a way that makes it easily trackable. I think a lot of people would find, especially when the dev kits come out, that if you try to use it in certain environments, maybe it won't work so well. So you still, people still have to sort of have an environment that they're playing the game in that's a trackable place. So even if you're designing a game that supposedly works anywhere, in AR, it's still going to have to work, at least with current technology, in a place that's trackable. So with that in mind, you have to make assumptions about the play space, and the more detail you get from the mesh, like in the case of the HoloLens, you can get really high-res mesh like instantaneously. You can probably use that mesh to determine, oh, this is a floor, oh, this is a table, and what have you. So you can, you can get more information about the environment and then make more gameplay decisions based on the data you're getting from the actual scan. So, but I don't know anything, you know, like, I, this is all 1.0. I made one game, you know, I mean, I, the, the, these dev kits really aren't in the hands of a lot of players. So I'm really excited to see what more developers come up with, because once these dev kits are out there and everybody has access to the technology, we're going to see all kinds of new gameplay ideas, because we're, I'm only really scratching the surface with what I've done. So I think we had a couple minutes for questions. If you want to follow me on Twitter or email me or whatever, you know, if you get interesting projects with AR you want to talk about, I'm, I'm game. I love the technology. It's a really interesting area. And I'll still be hanging around after the talk if anybody wants to ask questions. But I guess we got a couple minutes if anybody wants to ask anything. I don't know how you, oh, you can, there's microphones there. So I guess you can ask them if you want. Or you could just leave. It's fine. It's fine. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you.